Birch was rushed to the hospital Thursday after what the university is calling a catastrophic medical emergency. After he was found late Wednesday night, unconscious on the floor of the Kappa Sigma fraternity house. A report just released by the Morgantown police shows Birch had a blood alcohol content of 0.49. Surprise, was intoxicated, lips are blue, basically sharing a purple collar, attempting CPR. I don't think anyone realized how intoxicated Dina actually was. I'm gonna walk up to him and I immediately noticed something was up, that something was weird. And I, I look at him, I'm like, we need to roll him over, Jake. And I like, I like grab him and roll him over and immediately I saw foam. His lips were completely swollen, like not swollen, but like blue, uh -huh. his tongue. And then that's when I looked at his hand. I knew when I saw his fingertips that I was like, okay, I need to do something now. I checked his pulse. I said, Jake, I said, he's dead. He was a small kid, but he was like, he had a big character. When you're standing next to him, he was, he was bigger than you. You're walking into a party with him and everybody knows Nolan. He's talking to the first kid. You go to the house, you're nervous, and Nolan's out there like, what's good, what, what up? And I was 20, at least 20 something, and he was like fresh out of high school, so I was already like at least two years. He comes up, he's like, what up, bro? How you doing today? And I'm just like, hey, what up, bro? I didn't really know him that much, and he's just like, you know, outgoing like that towards me, so I'm like, all right. I can, I can, I can rock with this kid a little bit. He definitely lived life to the fullest. He had a youthful personality, always jovial and fun to be around. Nolan was definitely the loudest person in the room at a party. Pretty energetic, pretty, pretty lit. He wasn't arrogant. He wasn't stuck up. Um, he was all around a, a good person, a nice guy. Nolan would go out of his way all the time. Like even during pledging and stuff, he would. He would be one of the first people to step up and and just do and you know I'll help out with this I'll you know take time out of my day to do this and would always like if I even need help with like moving, moving stuff or doing something quickly I would know I could just ask him and he would be over if he had nothing else going on right away. He was willing to to go out of his way for for somebody if you need if you need a hand if you need a helping hand I got you. After midnight and um, the phone rang and I didn't get up I don't know why I didn't I didn't answer it a few seconds later it rang again and I don't know why but I didn't answer it again I don't know if I just I knew what it was gonna be or the third time it rang and I was like something's wrong she came running up uh, with the phone it was one of the, the frat brothers on the phone and he basically told me that there was a problem I had to call the hospital. And I said, well, what happened? He said, it's Nolan. And then I said, what? You know, what he goes, he, he's in the hospital. I'd rather you just talk to the hospital. That's when the hell all started, basically. I eventually got in touch with the doctor and asked what, you know, what happened? What's, what's going on? I was told that, you know, I need to call and I believe my son's in, in the hospital. And he said, yes, he went into cardiac arrest. And that right there kind of gave me a jolt that I, it still didn't sit with me. I'm like, well, what, how? And he said he had been at a party, he'd been drinking or something. I'm not even sure exactly what he said. All I remember saying is, well, should we come down there? So in my head, I was thinking, he's going to be fine. Just the doctor, I'm talking to you on the phone, take care of my son. And I just remember him saying, you, yeah, you need to come. And. Um, Obviously, it hit me then, like, you know, of course I need to go. He's went into cardiac arrest. He's, he's in the hospital. And then by the time we got to the hospital and the ER doctor met us, he was crying. 
And so when a doctor meets you and he's crying, that's not good. It's not a good sign. So kind of knew then that it wasn't going to be good. He was telling us that Nolan is in intensive care. He's upstairs and he's on life support. That was like when it hit, you know, kind of really, really hit. It's like, what in the world is going on right now? We knew he came in with alcohol poisoning. So he was pledging in a fraternity and um, it was the last night. It was the night that they were to meet their big brother. So they were taken, blindfolded, taken out of the fraternity house and taken over to another location. He was taken into a room by his big brother. There was a, a little sister in there. From what we know, he was given a bottle of whiskey and that's all we know. Uh, I don't, we don't know what happened in that room. Uh, they're not telling us. So the code of silence is something that I think human beings know. Even four-year-olds know when the teacher suddenly turns out the lights and says, who did that? Everybody is quiet. They kind of know not to tell the authority figure. And that kind of inbreeding between who's going to be reporting it and who you're calling and how safe are you and what is really anonymous is part of why we don't tell and why hazing doesn't get reported. And everybody is more concerned about saving their own ass than they are about taking care of the person who could be saved at that moment. In, in SAE, in my fraternity, the number one rule was, you know, you must protect the house. But, you know, like, uh, like in, the, in the case with, with, with Nolan, I mean, you know, these, his pledge brothers seem to be prioritizing their allegiance to an organization that they're barely a part of um, for a short period of time over the life of a fellow human being, you know, that they knew. I just want to get that across to you. You understand the seriousness there's a guy, a kid laying up there dying right now. I, I know, I was crying up once. And you're worried about brothers that threw him on that plank, that stage, that piece of wood, like a piece of meat, and left him there, right? No, it's not. You haven't seen the video. We've seen the video. It's disgusting <clears throat> what happened to him. Yeah. So anything you're trying to protect Brothers, trust me, don't waste your breath trying to protect them. They don't deserve it. It seems to me that kids have been drinking and getting drunk on college campuses forever and mixing them with drugs and alcohol all the time. What people have to understand when they hear that somebody died from an overdose of alcohol is that that kid did not choose to drink that much alcohol. That kid was coerced by their fraternity brothers who are supposed to be part of the family and take care of them to drink X amount of alcohol and Y amount of time. Much, much, much more alcohol than they would have normally in a much shorter amount of time. And that's what's killing kids. I've seen a variety of kind of counter arguments and theories that get trotted out. Oh, I, I wanted to, to drink all this. Oh, nobody was making me do it, right? When, when we got there, our bigs gave, uh, gave us like a bottle. Everybody had like different stuff, and uh, we were just drinking it with our uh, our big sister and big brother. But they they bought the bottle for us, um, and they told you what? Uh, drink, drink, and drink, drink, drink. Uh, which I did, and that's why I ended up in the hospital. My name is Dr. Joshua Dower. I'm the director of pediatric supportive care at WB Medicine Children's. I believe that Nolan's alcohol level was so high that he probably could not maintain consciousness. He would have been in a deep state of sleep to a place where it would have been very hard or impossible to wake him up to a level where he could function and carry on a conversation or walk for himself. We were in touch with the Morgantown Police Department. They did tell us that they did have someone in the house who was cooperative, which is good. They had retrieved the video. I think that kind of shed a lot of light on, on who was there, kind of what happened, what the timeline was, all that other kind of stuff. He lost bodily function. They thought that was funny. Losing your bodily functions, alcohol, put you're dying. And then turning blue and then that's when they finally called um, for somebody to come help. Paramedics came and they worked on him from what 
we understand, quite a while, and then transported him over to uh, Ruby Memorial. So Nolan was admitted to the intensive care unit, and the intensive care nurses were really concerned. You know, here we know what the final outcome is as we're having this conversation, but in those moments, we didn't know um, how serious things were. So we were really managing a lot of uncertainty. That's disturbing, like, to know that there were so many people in that house and walking around and seeing someone laying there like that and not calling for help. Not only were they watching, they were kicking, jumping up on the table, taking pictures, Snapchats, sending them to their friends. I mean, they thought that was funny. I'll never understand that. They could take a, a photo of somebody soiling themselves but they couldn't call 911. You know, why is he laying there like this? Somebody should have done something and could have done something. What I would say to the, to the kids that were in the frat that night or any other night uh, before then and after that is that, like, nothing is worth the risk of not taking it seriously. I mean, I understand you don't want to lose your, your kind of social capital in that world. You don't want to seem lame. Um, but any fear that you might have in the future of having been the guy who, you know, pulled the alarm on something, um, that will be nothing compared to the feeling that you had later in life knowing that you could have done something to save one of your friend's lives, but you didn't. I go back to not even when he was laying down. It was when they were bringing him in. He obviously needed major help. He was lifeless. That is the inconceivable part to me. We were actually told that if he had been taken right to the hospital, that he probably would be here right now. I've gone over it a million times. What were they thinking? And I, I don't know. I don't know the, I, I, you'd have to ask them. Some of the signs that, um, you know, that he was in trouble just boggle my mind is they thought it was comical. I mean, limp, not moving, uh, had soiled himself. Like, this is all funny to them, as opposed to this kid needs some help and needs help immediately. I wish I could go back in time, and I wish one of the kids there would have understood if someone is breathing less than eight times a minute, because we don't usually count our breathing, but imagine, you know, a normal person is breathing 14 to 20 times a minute. But if, if you're impaired with alcohol, your breathing may slow down and can eventually stop. Your heart rate, your pulse can slow down and can eventually stop when you have alcohol levels this high, you are not gonna be able to speak. You're not going to be able to move. You are going to be in a state of unconsciousness that if the people around him had been fully sober, monitoring this environment and checking anyone that appeared impaired, they would have seen that on the spectrum of impairment, someone on a couch that you can wake up is very different from someone that is laid out and is unresponsive and you can't wake them up. If you can't wake someone up pretty much for any medical reason, you need to call 911 because they probably need a doctor or someone to help them uh, or they might die. I'm not sure if it's you know, a desensitization because of social media, because of everything that's out there, because of attention spans that aren't there, or is it the alcohol that was involved? Because almost everybody there was drunk, even though there were supposed to be people that weren't, that were to watch out for things like this. Nobody got help until it was way too late. There's a lot of talk about leadership. You know, what is what leadership means, or will we create leaders, the next generation of leaders? But it's all kind of empty talk, right? There needs to be some kind of role in the fraternity where the role of that brother during that process is to advocate for for the health, for the sanity of um, of their pledges, not even just um, purely out of care for other people, which you hope that they would have. But even if you even if you are callous to that, but you care about your fraternity and you care about your school, you care about your culture, right? You want to make sure that that what happened to Nolan doesn't happen to your guys. You want to make sure that it doesn't happen to anyone. Anything that could go wrong that night did. And then at the end of the day, nobody got him any help. Like I said, we wouldn't be sitting here right now having this conversation if one person had made a call. One, we'd have our son. That's the hard part. That's the struggle, too, because you wonder if you did enough as a parent. Um, we had those conversations with Nolan. It's flat out, here's one thing that you do not do. And it's exactly how he died. It's chugging a bottle of alcohol. As 
A mother, you're supposed to protect your kids. And to think that he was laying there and I wasn't with him, I, to think that I couldn't protect him from what they did to him, I mean, I, I would have taken his spot in a second. I would have taken his spot in a minute. He was too good. He didn't deserve that. You wake up every day and it's like there's a hole. You can never, never, ever, ever fill it. It truly is an emptiness. I mean, he's gone. He's gone and he's never coming back. I lost my only son. I don't have a son anymore. I don't have anybody to carry on the name or to do whatever. I don't have a little boy. I don't have my boy that I can hug and, and smell and talk to and mess around with. He's gone and it's indescribable to tell you how I feel. It's the most horrible. <laughs> It's, it, the horrible's not even a word, it's beyond horrible. So think of the worst nightmare and then go 20 times beyond that. That's what it feels like. You're not supposed to bury your kid. You're just not. There's nothing right about any of it. It's, it's not right. It makes you angry, it makes you angry at yourself. I was angry, and maybe still am a little bit, at, at Nolan. I was like, come on, kid, you know better than this. What in the world happened? You're definitely angry at the, the people that were with him. You're, and then eventually you realize you can't really hold on to the anger. All you can do is to make sure it doesn't happen to anybody else. I try to imagine sending my son off to college and having him die three months later and figuring out how I would go forward and live my life. I'm a palliative care dog, and I'm not sure. This is the kind of event that, you know, kind of weighs on you over time, and it makes no sense. It didn't have to happen. I don't think people can understand, because when you see somebody who's 19, 20 years old, whose life is just beginning, being taken away by, in my opinion, a stupid event that could have been addressed in safer ways. But what happens is you get young people and, and alcohol and Stupidity takes over and you can't always cure stupid, so we try to work around it and try to educate people. Uh, it, it's unfortunate these tragedies happen, but it happens across this country. One thing, if, if there's anything we could do, it's, it's to get people to understand that hazing is not a ritual. It's not something that benefits anybody. It's, it's criminal and it's against the law. It hurts people. And in, in this case, a young person lost his life for no good reason. Hazing has to stop. I don't look at it as hazing, honestly, um, I, in the big picture, just the way I was brought up. Um, I played sports my whole life, so you needed to fit in. So there are two things here. When someone has participated in a hazing and then they rewrite it so, oh no, it was his own free will to drink that full bottle of uh, whiskey within 10 minutes while somebody was there making sure that he did it or many people were there saying more, 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 more and surrounding him and absolutely giving him no choice. For them to then walk away with a halo and pretend that he chose to do that. But the second part of the part of hazing that is very difficult to explain to any audience is consent. There is no such thing as consent in a hazing because the hazing is, by definition, hidden, mysterious, anxiety-provoking. We do not tell you in advance what we're going to do to you. We make it seem like you will be safe, and it's just going to be a party, a little drinking. We don't tell you what we're going to do next. We don't tell you how much we're going to hurt you, how much we're going to humiliate you. Because. Once you're intoxicated, as far as the law is concerned, you can't, you know, you can't consent to um, to signing a contract. You can't consent to um, even even you can't even consent to having sex with someone in the world uh, as as it's moving now. The thing is, there was always an open door policy. Like if you're not comfortable with what's going on, like you're more than welcome to leave. Like no one would ever force you. It's like you you're not a part of this anymore, but you're more than welcome to leave. So I remember one night we had to clean out like a bunch of different rooms. And like, that was kind of like the hazing thing. And this kid was like, ah, I don't want to do this. Like, are you kidding me? Like, this is like so tedious. And he left that night. My mentality is different than other kids. Like, I like doing that hardcore shit. I like building a team. I like building around other people, but not everybody does. So like they joined the fraternity and like that kid walked out that night, but like he wasn't really liked anymore. 
And like, that's something that probably should change. I think that the open door policy is more of a theory uh, and the theory is more of a myth. I think a lot of frats do say, you know, everything is voluntary. You can leave whenever you want. Um, you know, won't be held against you. Um, it, it, that's what they could say in theory, but in practice, I don't think that that really um, ends up being true. Um, and if it were true, uh, then everybody would just choose to be a fraternity brother without doing any hazing at all. Nobody really wants to go through that experience, right? Maybe on, on some level, in some perverse way, but nobody actually wants to literally go through on a day-by-day -day level the, the horrible things that you're forced to do. Otherwise, you know, uh, you know, people would be doing them on their own time, and they're not. I wouldn't think a night like that would just end up in, you know, agony. Didn't register with me. I've never had a friend. I've never lost a friend from drinking. It's like I went out last night, partied, never thought it could happen to me. That could have easily been anyone. Like, that could have been me. That could have been, you know, Jay, John, anybody. You really don't know it'll, it'll happen to you until it happens. It's just one of those things you're like, wow, like, that, that literally changed everything. Well, one of the things that I, that I find most troubling to me, most shocking to me, is that I could see very easily that could have been me, could have been one of my best buddies, could have been my roommate. Nolan never thought that he was going to die. We never thought Nolan was going to die. We never in a million years thought that this would happen to our family. I try to kind of put myself in their place, too. It's a lose, lose, lose all the way around for everybody. No matter what happens in these kind of scenarios, it, it, it's bad for everybody involved. So do the right thing. When we had made the decision that we were going to be taking Nolan off of life support, we decided that we would let his friends come through. We wanted them to say goodbye to Nolan, but we also did it because we wanted these kids to see what had happened. Seeing him like that in the back of our minds just wanted to show these kids, look it, are you kidding me right now? The scene as a whole was just, it was just really sad. Everybody was crying, everybody was um, just down. I was like, I don't even believe it. I didn't believe it. I was like, how, how am I gonna believe that? It's my best friend. It was hundreds of kids, lines. Kind of had to see his parents and all of his friends and family and kind of waited there just to see what the real situation was, so. I thought it was gonna be like a pull through, but it, it definitely wasn't. It's a curveball. It's, a, it's, it's, you know, it's like a punch in the face. It hit me too, so it took me a while to, you know, like, you know, calm down a little bit. If the culture was still the beer culture, I, I would have less concerns and issues. Liquor has such a different impact on these young people's lives than beer. You can only drink so much beer before you start getting rid of your beer. But liquor, some people can drink too much liquor too quick, and it impacts their health far more. But it's those who, either through pressure from other students or or whatever the peer pressure may come from, they drink too much. I have been university president so long that I can remember when the drinking age was 18. Then it moved to 21. By moving it to 21 on a college campus, we have created a binge drinking society, which is unholy almost. Kids uh, knowing that they're not supposed to do it, but yet they know that they want to drink, they'll go into dark places, into basements, and they'll become so intoxicated that their behavior changes dramatically. If you switch a beer for hard liquor like whiskey or rum, you again are going to increase the alcohol ingestion potentially by a factor of 10. So you may get 10 times as drunk if you're replacing something with 100 proof or 50% alcohol instead of a beer with 5% alcohol for the same volume. Like someone that was drinking Evan Williams, Kentucky bourbon, that's 100 proof. That's 50% alcohol. So if you weigh 140 pounds and you drink the fifth of whiskey, fifth of whiskey is 750 milliliters or 25 ounces, that's about 17 mixed drinks. So if you weigh 140 pounds and you drink 17 mixed drinks in an hour, your blood alcohol level will be 650. That's eight times the legal limit. The lethal dose where 50% of people die from alcohol poisoning is 400. Somebody asked me if there was a point that night where Nolan could be saved. The answer is 
Yes. One, if, if they had known the dangers of extreme binge drinking or high intensity drinking, and had understood that if you weigh 140 pounds and you don't have alcohol tolerance, the same amount of alcohol that you ingest can be really dangerous. If Nolan Birch had drank a pint of beer in an hour, the same body weight, but with 5% alcohol instead of 50% alcohol, chugging that beer would have changed his blood alcohol level to 0.04, okay? So he could have had two drinks in an hour, and he would have been at 0.08, which has been discussed as a legal limit for driving, even though no alcohol in your system is appropriate to be operating a motor vehicle. So understand, because that pint is liquor or bourbon instead of beer, his blood alcohol level is 10 times higher for the same amount of liquid that he ingested because it's percent alcohol by volume. I gotta tell you, I did not know that when I was 19. I didn't understand the mathematics of beer versus wine versus liquor. I believe that there were times where people in my environment got dangerously intoxicated and, and I didn't appreciate the warning signs. And, and I know better now, and I think part of knowing better is sharing warning signs that might save a life. So what's the point when you become the life of the party? What's the point when you're not able to function at the party. And where does it start to get dangerous? Once you hit the threshold where you're becoming unresponsive, unable to manage your functions, you're really intoxicated if you lose the ability to hold your urine and you pee, right? But I, I've had people say, oh, you know, someone was so drunk that they, they couldn't hold their urine. And they thought it was funny. What was really dangerous, they could have died. They were getting in that level of 300 to 400 where their breathing may slow, their heart may slow, their lips may turn blue, their fingers may turn blue. They may stop getting the circulation that they need. They may get cold and clammy. Those are things that would really scare me, would make me want to call for help. So if a person is awake and still able to drink for themselves and get another drink, and they may be okay or they may not, right, because what's happening is the blood alcohol that they have taken in has not necessarily been absorbed through their stomach and went to their bloodstream and started to circulate through their body. So their blood alcohol level may be climbing while they're buzzed, but if they continue to drink, they can become severely intoxicated and impaired. I think the fact, um, as far as his story and what's saving lives is recognizing when somebody is in trouble to actually step in and to do something. Don't be the wallflower. Don't be the one that somebody's telling you not to do it. Step up, do the right thing, and make the right decisions. If you see somebody whose health may be impaired, call us. We'd rather come on those calls and address that health concern before it becomes a tragedy. And it's getting people to understand that that is the challenge. Because every year we have a new crowd. Every four years, we have a whole new generation. So it's an ongoing challenge to train these people and get them engaged in the community because a community is only as safe as you and the rest of the people in it. You're frat in trouble compared to losing a friend, a brother, or whatever in death. You're talking about a fraternity maybe getting a slap on the wrist. I look at it the opposite way. You do the right thing and you call. That's a positive for your fraternity. You might get scolded, you might get suspended for a little bit, but you did the right thing. You were a true brother. Come on, you guys. You're doing this because you're supposed to be together and it's lifelong and it's all this stuff. Well, the bond starts right there. You see somebody in trouble, help that somebody. There's amnesty laws in just about every state. Well, the amnesty program was actually a, a statute that was passed here that allows for a, a student or a bystander who sees someone who may have overdosed or, or drank too much to actually call and not be penalized for that, even if they've been drinking and they're underage, which we never have really enforced against somebody who called us for that. West Virginia medical amnesty provisions state, you may be protected if you stay with the person, identify yourself if requested, cooperate and provide any requested information. The ideal behind it, obviously, is to get people help so that we don't have to deal with these tragedies, you know, lose young lives in the process. 
Bottom line is you have to make sure that it doesn't happen to another child or another family um, or their friends because it, that ripple effect is so big, you just don't understand until it happens how many people are affected. But we also want to make certain that our students have, have a balanced uh, life here. I tell everyone that our goal is to have everyone make sure that they understand that they have to work smart, but they have to play smart too. And the play smart is what we're talking about right now. Playing smart does not mean that you mistreat other students. It doesn't mean you haze them. It doesn't mean that you force people to do uh, uh, acts of uh, personal violence that are, uh, that are highly inappropriate. Because that's not fun, that's stupid. And as long as I'm in this chair, I'm gonna squeeze out stupidity and create fun. We've never, like, gone out and said, you know, you guys can't do I mean, we know things are going to happen. Kids are going off to college, and of course they're going to dabble into things and try th new stuff, And but, I mean, at least be aware. Like, if somebody's hurting somebody, that's not a brotherhood. That's not a sisterhood. That's, that's somebody hurting somebody. Just get somebody help if they need it. That's basically what our goal is, is to educate others and not have another Nolan. Whether it be middle school, high school, college level, fraternities, sports teams, uh, bands, anybody will have us because they truly do believe now if you can save just one life, that ripple effect will, it, it's immeasurable. I already know that his story has saved lives. I know that in my heart. As sad as it is to say and as hard as that is to say, it's, um, it's, it'll save lives, and it has to. It has to, because it just can't. The pain is, I just can't describe it. It's indescribable, and you just don't want it to ever happen to anybody. It, it, it's, that's why we're doing it. And it's, um, it's tough to talk about your son all the time, and this is what happened. Um, but if it saves somebody, it's, it's all worth it, so. 5% of all college students admit to being hazed. 40% admit to knowing about hazing activities. At least one college student has died on a hazing-related incident every year since 1970. Though most hazing incidents often go unreported. Additionally, an estimated 88,000 people die from alcohol-related causes every year, making alcohol the third leading preventable cause of death in the United States. If someone is in danger, step up. Call 911.